This is Jesus' conclusion to the Sermon on the Kingdom. And it is not an invitation. There are a lot of people that think invitations have to be offered to people to, to come to Christ and you invite them to know the Lord. But instead, Jesus offers a command. A command. Enter through the narrow gate. Now we notice again last week that this is a contrast of those who are in the kingdom of God and those who are not in the kingdom of God. We've noticed that throughout the Sermon on the Mount there is a contrast between those who have a religion and a Christianity that is based on what they do as opposed to those who have a faith that is built on what God has done. One is the religion of self-achievement. One is the religion of, I can do this myself. One is the religion of, I'll pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'll make sure that I get into the kingdom. And the other is the way of trusting in what God has already done in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. One is self-achievement, human achievement. The other is divine achievement and what God has done. Now you see the contrast throughout the sermon, beginning here in verse 13, all the way to the end of the chapter, you see the contrasts. Two gates, two roads, two destinations, two groups of travelers, two trees, two kinds of fruit, two builders, two foundations, two houses, two outcomes. You see the dichotomy, you see the, the opposition of those two Things And you see the contrast. And Jesus preaching demands a response. You cannot remain neutral when it comes to Christ. We mentioned last week that indecision is a decision. And so you come to this point, it's, it's time to make a response. Jesus is demanding a response of those who have been listening to this sermon. It is decision time. It's make up your mind time on the mountain. Last week, just as a part of review, last week we looked at the two gates, the narrow gate and the wide gate. The broad gate is the gate of deception. We mentioned last week that it's a broad gate and over the door of that gate is a sign that says this way to heaven. It doesn't advertise that it leads to hell. It doesn't advertise that it leads away from Christ. That would not be any deception at all. But Satan is the master deceiver. He gives you a door or a gate with a sign that says this way to heaven. But Jesus says it doesn't lead there. This door is very popular, by the way. We mentioned last week that it's popular because there are no restrictions on your religious liberty. You can come in that gate and you don't have to change anything. You don't have to give up your lusts. You don't have to give up your appetites, your passions. You don't have to leave them at the gate. And that makes the broad way very appealing to so many people. But it's also popular because there are lots of people on that road. There are lots of people who choose that. Notice Jesus says, there are many who choose that way. So you're not alone. You're going to have all sorts of traveling companions as you walk the road to destruction. It's a lie. And to enter that broad gate means that you're lost. But then there's the narrow gate, which is the gate of righteousness. The gate of righteousness. This is the religion of faith. This is the religion of divine accomplishment. It is trusting in the finished work of Christ on the cross. And the choice must be made. Jesus says, enter the narrow gate. This is his appeal. This is his demand. And you either enter the gate of human accomplishment or divine accomplishment. The gate of self-righteousness or divine righteousness. The gate that leads to death or the gate that leads to eternal life. 
Now, I mentioned at the end of the sermon last week that there are some requirements of entering in through this gate. And let me give several to you. I think there's about seven. First, you must enter. You must enter. Jesus says, enter the narrow gate. This is an aorist perfect tense. It is an imperative. It is a command. It, it could easily be translated, enter at once. Do this and do it now. In Luke's account, in Luke, I believe it's Luke 11, when he gives the account of the Sermon on the Kingdom, he has Jesus saying, strive to enter. Put forth the effort. It implies an urgency. You can't admire the narrow gate. You can't stand there and look and say, oh, that's a mighty fine looking gate. It's very appealing. It looks really nice. I think I'll go through that gate. No, it is not that you admire the gate. You don't admire Jesus. You don't marvel at his teaching and his miracles. If you marvel at who Jesus is and that's all you do, but you do not enter the gate, then you are still outside the kingdom. Jesus and the apostles, even God himself, when he spoke to his people, made this demand. Enter the narrow gate. Remember when John the Baptist started preaching in the wilderness, the first word of his sermon was repent. After Jesus' baptism and he came out of the water, his first sermon began with repent. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was asked, what must we do? He said, repent. This is the command of Christ. This is the command of God. And in Acts chapter 17, when Paul was in Athens, he said, God has overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he is declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. And later on, Peter would write in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not willing that any would perish, but that everyone come to repentance. You must enter. But there's something more to this, that you must enter this gate. You must enter this gate. There is no other gate. It, it is an exclusive gate. You can't pick your own gate. You can't choose what way you're going to walk and think that that way is going to lead you to heaven. Proverbs 14, 11, or I'm sorry, 14, 12 says there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it leads to death. You may think I'll choose the way that I'm going to go and all dogs go to heaven. We're going to all end up there anyway. No, there's only one way to heaven. There's only one gate. And Jesus said, you must enter. The second requirement, you must enter by faith. You enter by faith. It's not works. It's not what you do. It's not what you could accomplish. It's not what you can merit. It's all about what he has done. Nothing can make us righteous in the sight of God. Nothing, absolutely nothing. In Isaiah 64 and verse six, Isaiah says, all of us have become like one who is unclean and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. They're to be discarded. They accomplish nothing. Turn over to Romans chapter three for just a brief look at Paul's thoughts here. Romans chapter 3 and verses 21 and 22. Paul is writing about this righteousness that we can receive by faith. And he says in Romans 3, 21, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all those who believe. This is what Jesus is saying. You must enter this gate and you must enter by faith. 
Paul says in Ephesians 1, verse 13, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You see, only believing in Christ alone, only by hearing the only gospel that there is, only by facing faith, placing faith in Christ and his work and in not in your own, only then are you saved from the punishment that sin deserves. Only by accepting by faith what he revealed to us in Christ, only by believing the truth of the word. This is a very narrow way. And God has set the standard. He establishes the requirements. And God says only through faith in Christ. Because only Christ can atone. There's only one gate. And it's Christ. It's very narrow. But there's good news. God says through Jeremiah in Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart, you must enter. You must enter this gate. You must enter by faith. Thirdly, you must enter alone. Alone. This is an exclusive command at the very beginning. You enter alone. It is uniquely and intentionally personal. You're not born into it. It's not because of who your family is. It's not your religious tradition. You were raised that way. It's not that you joined a church. You're not swept in with the crowd. Remember last week we talked about a turnstile. That's what you think of on the narrow gate. It's a turnstile. You come through one person at a time. If you're going along with the crowd, that describes your life before Christ. You were running with the crowd, but you were separated from God. But salvation is an individual matter. It's an individual miracle. You and your family may be saved, but only because each individual comes. You, you're, you're, it's not collective salvation. It is salvation each person at a time. You see, that's what the Pharisees thought. They said, oh, we are Abraham's children, so we're obviously in. And Jesus says, no, you come one at a time. It's individual. And everyone has to deal with their own sin and come to Christ separated from the crowd one at a time. You must enter this gate. You must enter by faith. You enter alone. Fourth, you must enter with difficulty. With difficulty. Again, this is an exclusive command at the very beginning. It's not an easy decision. It will cost you everything. In verse 13, notice Jesus says, there are many who choose the broad way. That's the crowd. That's where everybody is. But in verse 14, notice that he says about the narrow way, only a few find it. Find. Mark that word some way or another. It means that you, it is not readily available. It means that it requires searching. It requires looking. It requires diligence. It has to be found. And it is only found when, by the Holy Spirit working in our otherwise rebellious heart, brings us to the point of seeking after the things of God. Listen to Jesus' words from Luke 13, 24. He says, make every effort to enter the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to do so. Does that sound easy? It's not. Many people will seek to enter into heaven, but, and they might want to walk through the narrow gate, but they won't. They won't find it because they're looking in all the wrong places. In Isaiah 
chapter 55, the Lord says this, beginning in verse 7. He says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on, to, on him and return to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Again, this is the promise of God that if you are seeking for him, you will find him, but it demands diligence. You have to put yourself in a position where you can look at that gate. If you're looking for an easy way to heaven, you won't find it. It is more than praying a prayer or signing a card or raising your hand or even entering into a baptistry. It's more than that. People who just flippantly go through the motions without a heart change will never see the kingdom of God. The word Jesus used there in Luke, strive to enter, is the Greek word agonizomai, from which we get the word agonize. It is an intense effort. It is struggling. It is the athlete who strives with every fiber of his being to win. And that's the walk of faith. That's the going through the narrow gate. It is a battlefield. And that's why only those who seek the Lord with all their heart will find that narrow gate. Amen. You must enter next. You must enter naked. Again, the turnstile comes to mind. You, you enter with no baggage. You throw off everything in order to enter. It is the gate of self-denial. You strip yourself of sin. You strip yourself of self-righteousness. You strip yourself of everything that you can think of that has to do with this life that you think will gain entrance into the kingdom. As the hymn writer wrote, and we sang earlier, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. This is laying aside everything. The rich young ruler did not find the narrow gate because he was unwilling to give up his baggage. He had his wealth and it was more important to him than heaven and so he did not lay it aside. This is the beatitude attitude that begins in Matthew 5 and verse 13, 5 and verse 3, excuse me. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We have laid aside everything. We have trusted only in Christ. All our self-righteousness is gone. All self-righteousness has eroded and we have bowed to the truth that we are a little child who has nothing by which we could commend ourselves before God. This is what it means to come naked. Next, you must come with repentance. You must enter with repentance. Listen, acknowledging your sin is a requirement for admission. But merely acknowledging your sin without repenting is useless. Remember, repentance means a complete turnaround. A 180 degree turn. You are forsaking sin and walking now toward Christ. So there must be repentance. Charles Spurgeon wrote, you and your sins must separate or you and your God will never come together. No one sin may, keep, may you keep. They must all be given up. They must all be brought out like the Canaanite kings from the cave and be hanged up in the sun. All the sin has to be forsaken. All of it has to be killed. One Puritan writer said, you must be killing sin or sin will be killing you. So we come in repentance. Entrance through the narrow gate demands that we turn from sin and serve the living God. Anything less is a cheap grace. We take advantage of the grace of God, a cheap grace that demands no change. And we just simply add Christ to our already cluttered, jumbled life. No, Jesus demands that you repent. 
Scripture describes the redeemed life as one that is totally reformed, totally transformed. It is repentant. It is changed. It is forsaking sin and yielding to the will of God in your daily life so that you live a life of holiness and righteousness to the glory of God. Anything less than a transformed, repentant life is a demonic faith that condemns people to hell. Seven, you must enter in submission. In submission. You forsake everything else and you surrender to Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about all the things that he had that he thought he could trust in. He talked about his heritage. He talked about the fact that he was a, a trained leader and teacher. Uh, he talked about all the things that he, was, he could easily trust in. But he said, I consider them all to be rubbish, garbage, filth. The word he used was dung. All of the things that we think we can trust in have to be surrendered to Jesus Christ alone. We are yielded to his lordship. The narrow gate is the hard way, but it is the only way to heaven. There was a, um, a West Indian man who chose Islam over Christianity. And he shared his testimony as to why he chose Islam over Christianity. He said, Islam is a noble, broad path. There is room for a man and his sin on it. The way of Christ is too narrow. You know what? He's right. The wide gate, you can have your sin and you can have your religion. Again, the sign says this way to heaven, but it's a lie. We must enter through the narrow gate by faith alone with great difficulty, naked of all our self-righteous efforts, repentant, forsaking all sin, and wholly and completely surrendered to Christ as Lord and Master. Those are the two gates. So real quickly, let's look at the rest of what Jesus has to say. There are the two ways. We read earlier from Psalm 1 describing the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And Jesus is giving us the same thing here. The broad way is the way of diversity. Again, there are no restrictions on the broad way. You can have your diverse theology. You can have your point of view and everyone else can too, even if they are conflicting and contradicting points of view. There's also room for tolerating sin and iniquity because there are no curbs to your passions. There are no restrictions on your lusts. There are no rules, no boundaries for personal living and conduct. You, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff on the broad road. And in that way, you can go through the motions of religious activity, but never truly conform to the doctrines of personal holiness. And there are many who choose that broad way. Again, no need for beatitude attitudes, humility, sorrow for sin, meekness, spiritual hunger, mercy, purity, peaceful living. It's, it's all, on the broad way, it's all very mechanical. It's all very... Um, very hypocritical. You can fulfill your fleshly lusts and your desires. You can exercise all the self-gratification. You can boost your ego by your out-of-control pride. You can live a life of covetousness. It doesn't matter how you live on the broad way. You can check off a few little boxes and ceremonies. You do a few good things now and then and, and you're okay. But remember what the psalmist said in chapter 1 and verse 6, the way of the wicked will perish. The broad way is the way of diversity. The narrow way is the way of holiness. The way of holiness, it demands the righteousness of Christ. It demands that we jettison everything and leave it behind, leaving the baggage of our sin behind and walking the path of holiness. 
That's what it means to walk the narrow way. That word narrow is a, is a word, we describe it like a turnstile, but it's, it's a word that really means pressed together. It is a confined or constricting walk. It gives you the picture of two cliffs on either side. You remember, you remember Balaam when he was called by Balak to come and put a curse on Israel and he was riding his donkey and he came to that narrow place. The donkey couldn't turn from either way and he was pressed in on the sides. That's the narrow way. And what that means is that you must count the cost. Over in Luke 14, verse 26, the crowds were going along with Jesus and he turned to them and said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And then he gives a couple of illustrations. He says, who of you is going to build a tower, but he doesn't sit down and decide if he's got enough money to finish the project. If he doesn't count the cost and he doesn't finish the project, people are going to ridicule him. Or then he gives the illustration of a king who had to decide whether he can go out with 10,000 men against a king who's coming at him with 20,000. Is he strong enough to overcome them? You've got to count the cost. And that's Jesus' point. These are strong words. Enter through the narrow gate. It's the way of holiness. It is the hard way. And becoming a Christian demands that you understand the cost. Have you counted the cost? Coming to Christ through the narrow gate and walking the narrow way, you could potentially lose your family. You could possibly be persecuted. You might face chastening, but it means that you pursue holiness and righteousness continually. And that means that all the forces of hell are going to be focusing on you. They've declared war against you. And you must daily deny yourself and live according to the standard of God himself. This is no luxurious meadow that we just kind of dance through on the way to heaven. That's not it at all. This is a minefield. Jesus didn't call you by saying, love me, admire me. Jesus said, follow me. And then he went to the cross. This is the narrow way. Two gates, two ways. Next, there are two destinations. The broad way leads to destruction. Notice that in verse 13. That's a sad word, a sad word, destruction. Why is it so sad? Well, look down to verse 22 for just a moment. Jesus is not talking about irreligious people. <clears throat> He's not talking about wicked people. He's not talking about evil people. Look who he's talking about. Look at verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, and we'll deal with this in a week or so, but many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? Listen, Jesus is talking about religious people. He was talking to Jewish people who kept the temple feasts year after year after year, who offered their sacrifices day after day after day. He's talking about Muslim people who three times a day stop and face Mecca and bow down and pray and then commit themselves to at least once in their lifetime taking a pilgrimage to Mecca. He's talking about Mormons and Roman Catholics who have their religious activities and their religious rituals. He's talking about people in Christian churches who walk in week after week after week, year after year, thinking that one time a week is all they need to offer the Lord. No service, no sacrifice, no use your talents, no use of spiritual gifts. Some people don't even know that they have spiritual gifts. He's talking about religious people. And he says the road is crowded. 
The people are tripping along the way, thinking that they're headed to heaven, but they have deceived themselves with their own self-righteousness, all of their own works, thinking that's going to get them there. The religion of human achievement leads nowhere but to hell. Hell will be occupied with many religious people. People who said, Lord, didn't we preach in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do miraculous things in your name? Religious people. It's the road to destruction. But there's the other road, the other destination, that is the narrow road leads to the way of eternal life. Eternal life, eternal is not necessarily about duration. Eternal life is about the quality of life. It is the life of the soul of man in its glorious state. The unclouded, uninhibited, glorious fellowship with God in heaven. It is the unspeakable joy of eternal satisfaction. So there are two gates, two roads, two destinations, two crowds. Notice there's a large crowd that goes the broad way, and that is a road that is filled with disappointment. Filled with disappointment. They love their sin. They're satisfied with their self-righteousness. They are content with an easy way. And false teachers are selling tickets by the thousands to enter through this broad gate. And people are buying them without a thought. Why? Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 and verses 3 and 4 that the reason is they are duped and they are blinded to the gospel. He says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. In other words, he has blinded them to the narrow gate. They can't see it. They can't find it because Satan has convinced them that their way is fine. So there's a large crowd that is going to meet with disappointment. And there's the small crowd, which is comprised of the redeemed. These are the redeemed. And for sure, it will be perhaps millions who will be in heaven for eternity. There are innumerable people who are going to be saved out of the great tribulation you read about in Revelation. A great number of children. Imagine the millions of babies who have been killed in the womb. But because they hold such a special place in the heart of God, we believe they are going to be there in the presence of the Lord. But when it's all said and done, out of all humanity that has ever lived, relatively few will have ever, ever stood at the crossroads and chosen the narrow way. You do realize, don't you, that when Israel left Egypt and marched on their way to the promised land, only two, only two people of that generation entered the promised land. Jacob and Carol and Caleb. Caleb and Joshua, excuse me. Only two. Some people estimate that there were as many as two million Jews who left Egypt. And out of two million, two made it to the promised land. Listen, that's the way it is. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, with, with most of them, God was not pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Jesus says, only a few will find this narrow gate. So of all the people who have ever stood at the crossroads, most have chosen the broad gate and the broad way. And we often look around us and wonder why so few are true to the word of God, why so few are true to the gospel of Christ, why so few live lives of holiness and righteousness that indicates the transformed life. Why so few? Because Jesus said that's the way it'll be. 
Many will find the broad way, only a few will find the narrow. Even within the scope of Christianity, you know, in the broad sense, only a few will make it, much less within the realms of Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and all the other works-oriented religions. The gate is wide, and many end up choosing the wide gate that leads only to destruction. There were a couple of other things that I noticed as you continue reading. In verse 21, there are two behaviors. I'll just mention these very briefly. Two behaviors, there are the sayers and the doers. There are those who say, yes, Lord, I love you. There are the doers who actually obey him. And then at the end, in verse 28 and 29, you see there are two teachers or two ways of teaching, if you'd rather. You've got Jesus' way of teaching, which is with authority. And you've got the scribes and Pharisees who taught with no authority. Diversity. Contrast. It's very prevalent throughout this sermon. Turn with me as we prepare to close to Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6, the prophet of God has some astounding words that will really drive home the point of standing at the crossroads, choosing the broad way or the narrow way. Jeremiah chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. God is speaking to his own people, and he has brought them, they're in captivity, he has brought them now to a point of decision, and the Lord says, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. That would be the narrow way. Where the good way is and, and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. And I said, a watchman over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster upon this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it. We all stand at that crossroads and the choice is ours. Either you choose the broad gate which leads to destruction where there will be cursing and torment, pain, sorrow, darkness, isolation, loneliness, an everlasting accusing conscience, weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. That's the broad road. Or we choose the narrow gate which leads to heaven and life and joy and peace and rest, fellowship, comfort, bliss, happiness. It's decision time. If you're an unbeliever this morning, if you happen to be here and you are walking in that religion of self-accomplishment, if you think that all the things that you do will get you there, if you think that you can work by the labors of your hands and be accepted by the Lord, then we have a word for you from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19 where the Apostle Paul says, look, God has committed to us the word of reconciliation and we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us and we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In other words, choose to enter this narrow gate and choose it today. Because he made him who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's the gospel. If you're still walking in self-righteousness, self-accomplishment, lay it aside. We as ambassadors for Christ plead with you. Repent. And be reconciled to God. And if you are a believer and you are confident that you are walking in the narrow path, 
then we have a word for you as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, Paul says, test yourselves to see if you are in, your, in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you fail the test? You see, for believers, it's our opportunity to examine our hearts, to make sure that we have repented of our sin, that we are trusting not in our works and not in our accomplishments, but we are trusting by faith only in Christ. So Jesus says, enter through the narrow gate. 